On April the 27th, 2005, the gigantic Airbus A380 airliner took to the skies for the first time, lifting off from Toulouse Black Knack Airport with test pilot Jacques Rosset at the controls. At that moment, the A380, weighing more than 500 tons and capable of carrying up to 853 passengers, became the largest commercial airliner to ever fly, dethroning the previous record holder, the venerable Boeing 747 Jumbo Jet. But while such giants might seem like products of the jet age, the dream of enormous ocean liners in the sky has been around for a lot longer. In the years immediately following the Second World War, Britain set out to build a truly gargantuan airliner with which it hoped to revolutionize air travel and knit its crumbling empire together. Instead, the project turned out to be a technological dead end and a costly white elephant. This is the story of the Bristol Brabazon. In 1942, the British government began thinking ahead to the future of the British aviation industry. The demands of war had forced the British to cancel pre-war airliner projects and devote its wartime production capacity to building combat aircraft like fighters and bombers. As a result, nearly all transport aircraft used by British forces during the war were American designs like the Douglas DC-3. Even Britain's national air carrier, the British Overseas Airways Corporation, or BOAC, was forced to fill its fleet with American aircraft like the Boeing 314 flying boat. This state of affairs, the government realized, would leave British aviation at a serious disadvantage once the war ended, as a December 24, 1942 article in Flight Magazine opined, The whole British Empire at the present time has an operational fleet of transport aircraft comprising conversions, makeshifts, and cast-offs totally inadequate to represent the empire in serving the air routes of the world in the peace to come. Have we to rely upon other nations to do it for us? The British aircraft industry is equal to the task. The government should decide this vital question at once. The seriousness of the situation was driven home in August 1942, when Prime Minister Winston Churchill was forced to travel to an Allied leaders conference in Moscow in the freezing Bombay of an American B-24 Liberator bomber. On his return, Churchill formed a special committee to evaluate the state of British commercial aviation and offer recommendations headed by former Minister of Aircraft Production John Moore Brabazon, first Baron Brabazon of Tara. A key figure in early British aviation, in 1909 Brabazon became the first person to fly a heavier-than-air aircraft on British soil, and in 1910 the first person in Britain to obtain an official pilot's license. He once also won a thousand-pound prize offered by the Daily Mail for taking a small pig aloft, proving once and for all that pigs can fly. The Brabazon Committee, as it became known, was remarkably far-sighted given the dire strait of the Allied war effort in late 1942. The committee met ten times between December 1942 and February 1943 before delivering its preliminary report to Churchill's cabinet. As a stopgap measure to ensure Britain would have at least some domestic commercial aircraft at the end of the war, the committee recommended developing civilian versions of existing military aircraft, such as the Avro Lancaster Heavy Bomber, Vickers Wellington, and Handley Page Halifax Medium Bombers, and Short Sunderland Flying Boat. Looking further ahead, the committee also recommended the development of five brand new designs to fill out Britain's post-war commercial fleet. These were the Type 1, a large, long-ranged airliner for flying the Atlantic, the Type 2, a replacement for the American Douglas DC for short-range European service, the Type 3, a medium-range airliner for Empire routes, and the Type 4, a high-speed jet-powered mail plane, and the Type 5, a short-range feeder liner for domestic routes. Three months after delivering this preliminary report, a second Brabazon committee, this time including members of BOAC, convened to refine its recommendations. The second Brabazon report added a further two aircraft types, the Type 2B, a more advanced version of the Type 2 to be powered by a brand new turboprop engine, and the Type 5B, a small eight-seat aircraft for short-haul domestic routes. Of these recommended aircraft projects, the Type 4 was by far the most ambitious due to the primitive state of jet engine technology at the time. So, the government focused its efforts on the Type 1, a giant airliner destined to fly passengers non-stop from London to New York or Cairo. But while technically more conventional than the Type 4, the Type 1 was no less ambitious a venture, calling for an aircraft far larger and more powerful than anything previously built in Britain. Fortuitously, the Bristol Aeroplane Company of Filton, Gloucestershire, had been working on a design for a super-heavy bomber with a range of 8,000 kilometers and a bomb payload of 15 tons. With Bristol's wartime 
production responsibility starting to wind down by mid-1943, the company submitted the design as a contender for the Brabazon Committee's Type 1 airliner requirements. The design was quickly approved and a government contract issued for the construction of two prototypes under the designation Bristol-made 167 Brabazon. Designed by lead engineer Sir Archibald Russell, who would later go on to head the design of the supersonic Concorde, the Brabazon was a leviathan in every sense of the word. 50 more meters long and weighing 100 tons, the aircraft featured a 9 meter wide fuselage with two passenger decks and an enormous 70 meter wingspan, larger than a Boeing 747 and exceeded only by the Airbus A380 airliner, the Hercules H4 Spruce Goose flying boat and the as yet unflown scaled composite strata launch. Lifting such a massive vehicle into the air required an enormous amount of power which Bristol planned to provide using no less than eight of the company's 2000 500 kilowatt Centaurus 18 cylinder radial engines, among the most powerful piston engines in the world at the time. But rather than place each Centaurus in its own nacelle, Bristol instead twins the engines, each pair feeding into a single gearbox driving twin contra rotating propellers. This minimized the space taken up by the engines, leaving the rest of the wing to carry the enormous amounts of fuel needed to cross the Atlantic. Furthermore, the engines were completely embedded within the wing itself, with only the propellers protruding from the leading edge, making the aircraft exceptionally aerodynamic. In addition to being enormous, the Brabazon was also among the first modern aircraft of its era. While earlier airliners like the Boeing 307 Stratoliner had featured pressurized cabins, these were largely converted from existing aircraft. The Brabazon, by contrast, was the first commercial aircraft to be designed from the ground up to be pressurized and featured sophisticated air conditioners and humidifiers to maximize passenger comfort. It was also the first aircraft to be fitted with 100% powered flight controls, high-pressure hydraulics, electric engine controls, and fully automated control trimming. The aircraft structure was also carefully designed to maximize structural efficiency. At such enormous scales, every ounce of weight matters, so rather than using a standard thickness of aluminium skin throughout, every panel was individually optimized for the loads it was expected to sustain. Yet, for all its enormous size and sophistication, the Brabazon's expected capacity was surprisingly small. While with modern closed space seating, the aircraft could have fit up to 300 passengers, in practice it was intended to carry no more than 100. This was because the Brabazon was less a 1940s jumbo jet than a flying ocean liner designed to serve an elite clientele of wealthy jet setters and government officials. Such passengers, Bristol reasoned, would settle for nothing less than the utmost in comfort and luxury, and on that metric, the Brabazon certainly delivered. Official plans for the internal layout gave each passenger a palatial 8 cubic meters of personal space, while the spacious cabin was equipped with sleeping berths, a lounge, a cocktail bar, and even a separate movie theater. But while this policy of catering to the ultra-wealthy had served BOAC's predecessor, Imperial Airways, well in the pre-war era, it would ultimately prove an outdated business model and the key factor in the Brabazon's ultimate demise. The Brabazon's design was finalized in November 1944, with construction of the first prototype beginning shortly after the war's end in October 1945. As even Bristol's enormous number two flight shed could barely accommodate the giant, construction also began on a much larger hangar, where up to eight Brabazons could be assembled at once. Measuring 300 meters long, 128 meters wide, and 35 meters high, at the time of completion it was the largest hangar in the world. The enormous aircraft also required an enormous runway, so Bristol further set about lengthening Filton Airfield's existing runway to 2,240 meters. Unfortunately, this required cutting right through the small village of Charlton. Despite spirited opposition from its inhabitants, the British government approved the expansion, and once the villagers were compensated and relocated to the nearby town of Patchway, Charlton Village was raised to the ground. As it later turned out, the Brabazon was more than capable of taking off from the existing runway, rendering the destruction of Charlton completely unnecessary. The construction of such an enormous aircraft proved more challenging than expected, and while the government expected the first prototype to take to the air by 1946, this deadline was repeatedly pushed back by various delays. There were other problems as well. As the aircraft began to take shape, it became apparent that even the planned eight Centaurus engines would leave the Brabazon hopelessly underpowered. Thankfully, Bristol had already begun development of the more powerful 2,500 kilowatt Proteus gas turbine, and it was soon decided to fit the second Brabazon Brabazon prototype and all subsequent production models with this engine. This would have allowed the Brabazon Mark II to cross the Atlantic in around 12 hours. However, the development of the Proteus was plagued with problems, causing severe delays 
and cost overruns. Worse still, BOAC, the airline that Brabazon was specifically designed for, was beginning to lose interest in the project, eyeing instead the wide variety of advanced airliners emerging from the American aviation industry, such as the Douglas DC-4 and the Lockheed Constellation. Before the first Brabazon had even left its hangar, dark clouds were beginning to gather on the horizon. After being postponed yet again. In December 1948, the first Brabazon prototype, GAGPW, was finally rolled out of its hangar at Filton. So tight was the fit that the operation was jokingly referred to as Operation Shoehorn. A breathless press hailed the gleaming silver giant as the Queen of the Skies, a technological triumph that would place Britain at the forefront of the commercial aviation industry and help bind its far-flung empire together. Nine months later, on September 3, 1949, the Brabazon, crewed by pilot William Pegg, co-pilot Walter Gibb, and eight flight test engineers, began taxi trials along the Filton runway. The trials revealed no major issues, aside from a malfunctioning nose wheel, and the aircraft was cleared to make its first flight the following day. In preparation for the flight, in December 1945, Pegg had traveled to the United States to practice flying the U.S. Air Force's Convair B-36 Peacemaker, an enormous nuclear strategic bomber with a wingspan identical to the Brabazon's. On the morning of September 4, 1949, a crowd of 10,000 people, including 250 newspaper reporters and photographers, gathered around Filton Airfield to witness the Brabazon's maiden flight. After conducting additional taxi tests, at 10 a.m., the enormous aircraft, its eight contra-rotating propellers droning loudly, trundled down the runway and lazily rose into the air, reportedly prompting pilot Bill Pegg to exclaim, Good God, it works. The flight, which was broadcast live by the BBC in eight languages, lasted a total of 27 minutes, with Pegg and Gibb ascending to an altitude of 900 meters and reaching a speed of 250 kilometers an hour. The aircraft proved surprisingly pleasant to fly, with Pegg stating, It was very comfortable. It flew very well. It was big. You didn't just whip it around like a tiger moth or spitfire, but as long as you treated it like a double-decker bus or a large aeroplane, you had no trouble at all. But Pegg and the British press's enthusiasm proved misplaced. For 39 days earlier, the de Havilland Comet, the world's first jet-powered airliner, had taken to the skies for the first time. Next to this sleek, futuristic comet, the lumbering Brabazon looked decidedly old-fashioned, a relic of a bygone era. Worse still, the comet had begun development a full two years after the Brabazon and was completed on budget, while the Brabazon, its development driven by political rather than economic forces, had exceeded its initial £3 million budget nearly fourfold. There were also major flaws in the Brabazon's design. Though designed to be as lightweight as possible, the Brabazon structure was simply a scaled-up version of earlier World War II-era designs, and despite its designer's best efforts, it proved inefficient and overly heavy. The Brabazon's engine housings were also prone to metal fatigue and tended to scrape along the runway, while the enormous wings were so stiff that the Ministry of Transport refused to issue an airworthiness certificate for flight above 7,600 meters, effectively killing the aircraft's potential as an efficient transatlantic airliner. Nonetheless, Bristol, still convinced it had a winner, prominently exhibited the Brabazon at London's Heathrow Airport and at the 1950 Farnborough and 1951 Paris Air Shows, inviting journalists and airline executives aboard to experience the aircraft's unrivaled spaciousness and smooth ride. Right. But by 1952, though purchases, domestic or foreign, were forthcoming, and the development of the turboprop-powered Mark II was postponed indefinitely. As it turned out, Bristol and the Brabazon Committee had severely misjudged the post-war aviation market and based the Brabazon's design on a hopelessly outdated business model. As pilot Bill Pegg later explained, the spec wasn't correct for post-war flying. The people who wrote the specs conceived of an aeroplane with all this comfort, bunks, and a great dining room to eat in. And of course, come the day, that wasn't what the airlines wanted. They wanted to ram as many passengers as possible into the tube and give them lunch on their laps. On July the 17th, 1953, having spent more than £11 million on what was clearly a useless white elephant, Minister of Supply Duncan Sandys announced the cancellation of the Brabazon project. In October of that year, the prototype, along with the uncompleted Mark II, was cut up and sold for £10,000 in scrap value, having flown only 382 hours and carried not a single paying passenger. Today, all the remains of Bristol's gargantuan post-war dream is a nose wheel preserved in the National Museum of Flight in East Fortune, Scotland. 
Interestingly, the Brabazon was not the only impractically large British airliner project of the post-war era. In 1945, aircraft firm Saunders Row began developing an enormous flying boat known as the SR-45 Princess, weighing 150 tons with a wingspan of 67 meters and powered by no fewer than 10 Bristol Proteus turboprops. The Princess was designed to carry up to 100 passengers non-stop across the Atlantic in supreme style. It's twin flight decks featuring every luxury and convenience imaginable, including a miniature children's playground complete with sandbox. Prior to the Second World War, flying boats had been popular with global airlines like BOAC and Pan American Airways, as they could take off and land from any large open body of water, eliminating the need for long prepared runways and allowing remote, underdeveloped destinations to be more easily served. The war, however, had brought about a dramatic improvement in airport facilities around the world, rendering large commercial flying boats obsolete. And while the Princess was developed according to specifications laid out by the Ministry of Supply and BOAC, in 1951 the airline revised its business strategy and decided to terminate the flying boat services, focusing instead on flying land-based routes using the jet-powered de Havilland Comet. With three enormously expensive prototypes already completed and no commercial buyers in sight, in desperation, Saunders Row turned to the British government who agreed to adopt the princess as a military transport. On August the 22nd, 1952, the first princess prototype, GALUN, flew for the first time over the Isle of Wight, with pilot Geoffrey Tyson at the controls, remaining airborne for 35 minutes. The aircraft would carry out a total of 46 test flights, totaling 100 flying hours, but continued issues with the Proteus engines resulted in development costs ballooning to nearly £12 million. In the end, the government chose to cancel the project altogether, and in 1967 the three princesses were cut up for scrap, having had the misfortune of becoming obsolete before they even left the drawing board. But while the Brabazon and the Princess are typically written off as wasteful government boondoggles, the money spent on these projects didn't go entirely to waste. Unsuited as they were to economic realities of their day, these aircraft nonetheless helped pioneer many key technologies that would see successful use in future designs, while the investment made in Bristol's hangar and runway facilities at Fulton would go on to pay large dividends. Indeed, shortly after the cancellation of the Brabazon, this hangar was converted to produce the turboprop-powered Bristol Britannia medium-range airliner designed to fulfill the Brabazon Committee's Type 3 aircraft requirements. The Britannia, along with other smaller 1950s British designs like the Vickers Viscounts and the de Havilland drone would see considerable success worldwide, proving that the British aviation industry had learned its lesson that bigger is not always better, and that the skies belonged not to the ultra wealthy, but to the masses. But in a way, the Brabazon might actually have been ahead of its time, for in recent years, operators of the giant Airbus A380, like Emirates, have begun offering their first-class passengers luxurious accommodations that BOAC executives of the 1940s could only have dreamed of, including private sleeping berths with showers and, in a now-abandoned Virgin Atlantic plan, even gyms and casinos. As they say, everything old is new again.